Hi guys, welcome back. In this section of the course, we're going to be talking about section strategy. So specific strategies that you can use for each section of the MCAT. So here's how each of these section strategy videos are going to work. First, I'm going to give you a list of recommended flashcard decks that you should make for each section. Then I'm going to give you a list of high yield topics for each section that you should have a really good grasp on by the time test day rolls around. Then I'm going to go into some specific strategies that you can use for each section. And I'm going to finish off reviewing three practice questions for that section that come from the MCAT Sample Question Guide, which is available for free on the AAMC website. This MCAT Sample Question Guide includes three practice questions and a passage for each of the four sections. So let's start off with Chem Fizz Strategy. In terms of flashcard decks, the number one flashcard deck that you should have for this section is your MCAT Equations flashcard deck. You can download an MCAT Equations Anki deck from online, or you can make your own. I recommend Googling list of MCAT equations, and there should be a few websites with a list of all of the MCAT equations that you have to memorize. Sometimes the MCAT will give you the equation, but there are a lot of equations that you do have to memorize for the MCAT, and remember that you won't have a calculator available. For chemistry topics, I recommend you have flashcard decks for the chemistry equations, like the Henderson-Hasselbach equation, flashcards about gas laws, like the ideal gas law, and the law of partial pressures, etc. Flashcard decks on kinetics and equilibrium would be great as well, as well as flashcard decks on acid bases, the terms and concepts contained within that topic. Keep in mind there are a lot of great Khan Academy videos that cover these topics in MCAT chemistry, organic chemistry, and physics, so use those as a resource to really improve your content knowledge and use their free practice questions to practice your application as well. So there are three topics in that chem phys section. You have general chemistry, organic chemistry, and physics. You might have a little bit of biochemistry worked in there as well. In terms of general chemistry, your high yield topics will be acids, bases, and buffers, and that's where that Henderson-Hasselbach equation comes in. Electrochemistry, the periodic table and the periodic table trends, gases and equilibrium, thermodynamics, stoichiometry, and Le Chatelier's principle. Organic chemistry is relatively limited on the MCAT, in fact, on my MCAT, I believe I only got maybe two to three total questions that involved organic chemistry. So when you're reviewing that organic chemistry material, don't go past OCHEM 1 or first semester topics in OCHEM because they usually won't ask anything too complex. But in the OCHEM questions that they do ask, they'll ask about bonds and functional groups especially, absorption spectra and NMR, substitution and elimination reactions, so be able to determine what type of substitution reaction it is and what type of elimination reaction it is, stereochemistry, redox reactions, so be able to look at a reaction and determine which molecule is being reduced and which molecule is being oxidized. Distillation and extraction are high yield topics when you're talking about experimentation in OCHEM, and you're also going to want to have carboxylic acid derivatives and carbonyls down. You might see a physics equation or a physics passage every once in a while, but most of the passages in this section will relate primarily to general and organic chemistry. It's especially easy to anticipate the questions in the physics passages because you'll be able to quickly identify the concepts they're getting at, and you can start to anticipate the equations that you might have to use to solve those physics problems. In my experience, most of the physics questions show up in the FSQ sections, because those are the questions that have a lot of equations and calculations that you'll have to do. The high yield topics in physics are optics, sound and the Doppler effect, fluids, electricity and magnetism, study Ohm's law, resistors and capacitors specifically, radioactive decay, and pressure, so calculating pressure at different depths, etc. When you are reading through these chem -phys passages, you should think, what are the reactants, and what are the products, and what are the catalysts? Because most of these chem -phys passages will relate to some sort of reaction occurring. While you're reading, you should consider why are they giving me this passage? What are the concepts they're trying to get at? Where have I seen some of this material before? What might they ask about these concepts? And what equations might I have to use to solve the questions in this section? When reading through those passages, start to identify some functional groups in the molecules that they're talking about, and think about how those functional groups engage in reactions, and what those functional groups will tell you about the reaction. 
start thinking about periodic trends that might apply to the passage. And if any of the molecules have any specific charges, start thinking about how those charges might affect the behavior of those molecules. So now I'm going to move into the chem phys passage on the MCAT sample question guide. If you want to do the passage before I review it, do it now. I'm filming this in November 2020, and so I'm going over the questions that are available on that sample question guide in November 2020. If you're watching this video at a different time, it might be a different passage or a different set of questions. So let's hop into this passage. The passage starts off by talking about an enzyme called IDO, which catalyzes this first reaction. So as soon as I see the term reaction 1, I'm going to take a look at the figure and see what reaction they're talking about. I can see there's an oxidation occurring because in the reaction above that reaction arrow, we see the catalyst is this enzyme IDO combined with O2. And that O2 tells me an oxidation is probably going to occur. You can also see the addition of two carbonyl functional groups after the reaction occurs. I go back to the passage, it says, this is the first and rate determining step of L-tryptophan metabolism and is an important enzyme of the human immune system. The terms that I specifically notice in that sentence are first and rate determining. So this is the rate limiting step of L-tryptophan metabolism overall. That tells us that the maximum speed that L-tryptophan metabolism can occur is the speed at which this reaction can occur. I'm going to store that bit of information away in my brain and maybe use it later. The passage goes on and says the IDO catalyzed oxidation of compound 1 by H2O2 does not occur. However, researchers have recently discovered that the IDO catalyzed oxidation of indole compound 3 by H2O2 does occur. And we notice that compound 3, which is a new compound, can be oxidized in three different products. And that's because the products have the plus signs in between them which means each of these products can occur from this reaction. We also know from the passage that IDO can catalyze the reaction of compound 1 to compound 2 using O2, but not H2O2. And the passage says, however, if we use IDO with H2O2, we can catalyze the reaction of compound 3 to compounds 4 through 6. And then continuing on in the passage, it says, under the conditions employed, the number of catalytic turnovers appeared to stop at roughly 100 on average. A plot of the concentration of compound 3. As soon as we get to that point, we know we're going to have some graphs and some experimental data. A plot of the concentration of compound 3 that was oxidized versus the concentration of H2O2 employed at two different initial concentrations of IDO gave the results shown in figure 1. So there's our figure. Passage goes on to say aerobic oxidation of compound 3 in the presence of radio-labeled oxygen. So we see that radio-labeled atom pretty often in experimental passages, both in the chem phys section and the bio section. And the more you see these types of experiments, the more it'll make sense to you. That radio label is a way for us to identify where those atoms are located. Aerobic oxidation of compound 3 in the presence of radiolabeled oxygen, labeled H2, 1802 resulted in the formation of 18 oxygen labeled oxidation products in table 1. So we have another figure. Finally, the passage goes on to say the formation of compound 6 does not appear to be the result of a sequential oxidation process. Isotopically radio labeled compound 4 does not exchange 18O for 16O in water over 3 hours but compound 6 completely loses its 18O radio label in unlabeled water over the same time period. So I've read the passage. The first thing I'm going to do is take a look at the figures. We've already looked at the reactions. Let's look here at figure 1. In this first figure, we see a graph. The first thing you're going to want to look at is the caption and the axes. The caption says stoichiometry of IDO catalyzed oxidation of compound 3 by H2O2 at 1 micromole and 10 micromole of IDO. The y-axis says the concentration of oxidized compound 3 and the x-axis has the concentration of H2O2. According to the caption, IDO is present and we can tell from this graph that if we have a higher concentration of IDO, we have a higher concentration of oxidized compound 3. We can also tell from this graph that if we have a higher concentration of H2O2, our oxidizer, we have a higher concentration of oxidized compound 3. If we shift over to the table, the caption of table 1 says isotopic composition of compound 3 oxidation products using H2 
O2 with a radio labeled oxygen. On the left hand side we have each of the products of that reaction too. On the right hand side we have the percentage of radio labeled oxygen that is incorporated. We see in compounds 4 and 5 100% of their oxygens have been replaced by that radio labeled oxygen. They can't incorporate two of those radio labeled oxygens because compounds 4 and 5 only have one oxygen. And then we see with compound 6 which has two oxygens 60% of those molecules have incorporated one radio-labeled oxygen, and 40% of those molecules have incorporated two radio-labeled oxygens. So let's hop into the questions. Question one says the progress of reaction two can be monitored by observing what change to the IR spectrum of the product mixture. So we identified earlier in this passage that these are oxidations, and that some functional groups are being added to the reactants to form the products. We talked about how carbonyl groups are being added. You can go back to the passage to make sure that you have identified identified those changes in the functional groups, or you can just remember which functional groups were added. So you should know your IR spec, which means you should know the IR spec indicator for a carbonyl group is between 1700 and 1750. So because in that reaction we see the appearance of a carbonyl, we should see the appearance of a sharp peak at that 1700 to 1750 range. For that 3400 range, that broad peak, we're probably talking about the appearance of a hydroxy group, and we don't see that appearance of a hydroxy group in the reaction. We only see the appearance of a carbonyl group. Let's move on to question two. Question two says the following kinetic parameters were obtained for the IDO catalyzed oxidation of compound three by H2O2 in the presence of L-tryptophan. We're given a table and the question stem says, based on this data, what effect does L-tryptophan have on the reaction? Well, our only variables here are the concentration of L-tryptophan and the K-cat. Now from your studies in chemistry and biochemistry, you should know that K-cat refers to the turnover of a substrate to a product. And we see as the concentration of L-tryptophan increases, that enzyme turnover decreases. So overall, this means that the enzyme produces less product when L-tryptophan increases. So we already like D as our best answer, and that ultimately will be the correct answer. We can get rid of answer A because there's no evidence that this L-tryptophan molecule will oxidize the reactant. We know that pretty specific conditions have to exist to oxidize compound three anyway. We need that enzyme and we also need H2O2, so A isn't a great answer for us. Also, the equation for K-cat is the Vmax over the total concentration of the enzyme, which means the total amount of available substrate would not affect the K-cat. We can eliminate B because it says in the passage that the IDO catalyzed oxidation of compound 1 by H2O2 does not occur. We can get rid of C because we see this decrease in catalytic activity when we increase the concentration of L-tryptophan. And L-tryptophan inhibiting the enzyme would also make sense because L-tryptophan looks similar to the desired substrate, which is compound three. So not interacting with the enzyme would not be our best answer here. That leaves D. Let's move on to question three. Question three says, which experiment can be used to show that compound six is not formed sequentially from either compound four or compound five? So we're looking for the best scientific procedure to determine that that compound six is not a result of oxidizing compound three into compound four or five, and then oxidizing compound four or five into compound six. You might wanna highlight that word not in the question stem that indicates we're looking for the answer that compound six is not formed sequentially. And we're gonna look for the answer that best makes sense with scientific thinking. A wouldn't make sense because it doesn't quite answer the question. We're looking for a sequential oxidation, not a reaction between compound four and compound five. We're looking for an oxidation of either compound four or compound five into compound six. B says oxidize compound four and compound five with the enzyme in H2O2 and identify the products. That's a good answer because if we identify that compound six can come from the oxidation of compound four, or compound five with the same enzyme and the same H2O2, that could mean that this is a sequential oxidation. But if we don't see any compound six with those reactants in the same experimental conditions, then we know that this is not a sequential oxidation. That would be direct evidence that it is not a sequential reaction. C isn't a great answer because we're not using the same experimental conditions as we used in the original reaction, reaction two. And we're looking for the best experiment that would tell us that this is not a sequential reaction. So if we reduced compound six and then we didn't see compounds four and five, that doesn't mean that four and five could not be oxidized into compound six, especially because we are not using those same experimental conditions. Answer choice D is kind of out there. 
Compound 2 doesn't have much to do with this reaction. That's the oxidative product of L-tryptophan with IDO, so we can basically eliminate that one right away. So hopefully walking through my thinking with you on this passage helps a little bit, and you can start to use some of the strategies that I've outlined for the ChemPhys section to really start to anticipate some of the questions that you might get in these ChemPhys passages, and start to identify some of the trends in the way that the MCAT likes to give passages and questions. Thanks for joining me in this video. In the next video, we're going to talk about CARS strategy. See you next time.